Hello and welcome. I'm Jim Falk. And in today's program, we're focusing on Israel. In a volatile region, uh, largely ruled by authoritarians and monarchs, Israel stands apart as a democracy. And it's a critical ally of the United States, receiving in excess of $3 billion a year, mostly in military assistance. Now, the Trump administration can point with justification to the Abraham Accords as a notable success, although we cannot avoid the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It cannot stay on the back shelf. So bringing their perspectives, we have two experts. First, let me welcome Ambassador Martin Indyk. He's with the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a senior fellow there, and he served as U.S. ambassador twice, and he was also in the Barack Obama administration, special envoy on Palestinian-Israeli relations. He's the author of a relatively new book, uh, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger, The Art of Middle East Diplomacy. From Israel, welcome Lieutenant Colonel Avital Leibovich. She's the director of the American Jewish Committee's office in Jerusalem. She had a long and distinguished career in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, and that included being head of the foreign press branch. So let's get started. So Ambassador, let me start the conversation with you. Why should Americans care about these upcoming elections in Israel that take place on November 1st? Well, Israel is a thriving democracy uh, and uh, a fellow democracy of the United States. So that's reason number one. Number two, Israel exists in a very uh, volatile environment, which Americans are by now familiar with, given our involvement there over so many years, particularly in the recent time, the wars in, in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Uh, and Israel is, an important, as you pointed out, Jim, an important ally uh, in this volatile region that we work with to try to uh, stabilize it and try to work with it to achieve peace there. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Israel's been going through a pretty volatile domestic uh, political uh, uh, battle uh, over elections for the last four years. This will be the fifth election, I think, in, in uh, five years. Uh, that's not normal for Israel. Um, but it is a reflection of something that we Americans are also familiar with, a deeply divided polity uh, with uh, the two blocks, a, a right-wing religious block on the one side and a, a centre-left secular and Arab block on the other, uh, finding it very difficult to get a majority uh, in the Knesset that would enable it to uh, last out its full term. And, each time the government has, has collapsed as the coalition has fallen apart, and we're going through that again now. I think people would be surprised to, that you use the word Arab bloc. How much influence uh, does that have? Well, uh, Israel's Arab citizens uh, represent about 20% of the population. They uh, are equal uh, in their rights and uh, therefore the right to vote. Israel's electoral system is different to ours. It's, it's a, a proportional representation system. So the number of votes the party gets uh, equals the number of seats. There are no constituencies. Uh, and so with 20% of the population, uh, if they had high voter turnout, which they usually don't because of a sense of alienation, uh, but if they had, they could get something like 15 seats, and they've done that in the past. Um, they too, like much of Israel, are divided into smaller parties. Uh, and in the last government, for the first time in Israel's history, an Arab party joined the government and and uh, worked with the uh, government. and so. That represents a sea change in uh, Israelis, Arab citizens' uh, attitude, where they now see the uh, benefit of engaging in the government and, and getting the spoils of office uh, that come with it that so many other parts of Israel's uh, polity have, have enjoyed in the past. So they now become a critical factor in a way that they were not in terms of forming coalitions. And this particular Arab party has made clear that it, it would be willing to go with the right-wing religious bloc or the centre-left secular bloc, uh, depending on who kind of makes them the better offer. 
That's really interesting. And to remind all of us, the Knesset has 120 seats, so it takes 61 to form a majority. Colonel, I understand that Israel has a very high percentage of people who vote, uh, something that we could be quite envious of. Tell us a little bit more about the political culture of Israel. Israel has been for decades uh, very much politically involved. The average Israeli civilian, when he gathers together with his family on Shabbat dinners, Friday night dinners, then usually the political um, uh, argument immediately comes on the table. And this is something which is very, very common. Uh, we do see, actually, we did see until the last elections, also a high percentage of voters among the Arab voters, uh, although that has decreased due to some uh, conflict between, or I would say lack of belief between the Arab voters and the Arab parties. But overall uh, in Israel, since the country was founded, the, the, the percentage of voting was around 80%. Now in the last uh, decade, it has dropped and it, it's around 70%, I would say 68 to 70%. So you can definitely say, Jim, that the Israelis are very, very much politically involved. So I'd like you both to take out your crystal balls. Um, amazing that uh, former Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, who held the position for at least 15 years, may be Prime Minister again. Is, is What's the likelihood of that? I, I think, you know, first of all, we, we have a little bit under 60 days. So this is really, really trying to do the the impossible, because if, if one thing you cannot do is predict any kind of result in Israeli elections. But since you asked, I would dare and say uh, that uh, I would say the following, the lower percentage rate by the Arab voters will be the higher probability of Netanyahu's party Likud to be stronger than in the past. So if in the past elections, uh, the number of seats uh, Netanyahu received was around 31, 32 seats, I assume that this time around, it will be around 34 seats, maybe even 35 seats. The reason is that there is a great disappointment by, these, by the general Israeli public uh, over the last government that was here in Israel, Often, the term uh, used to describe this government is an experimental government. So the Israeli public is looking for something stable, something not exper experimental, something that you know would, would take forward the country and, and lead, uh, lead on. So I would say uh, the Likud will build a coalition with Benny Gantz's party. This is what I think will happen. But there is one condition for that. Uh, I think that Benny Gantz will uh, demand to go first as a prime minister, and then Netanyahu will rotate with him after a year or two or, or three years. This is the only way I see uh, the outcome of the current elections. Ambassador, do you agree? And what do you think that may imply for U.S.-Israel relations? I think I do agree that it's extremely hard to predict what is going to happen. Of course. What we've seen in the last four elections is that Netanyahu has not been able to put together a coalition that gets him uh, past 61. He did it for a little while uh, in, in one, one go round. But, but that's his basic problem. How does he get the 61 votes that would give him a majority? The blocks are very solidified and there is, seems to be very little movement between the blocks. Uh, and so the question is, what will move the needle? Terrorism does have an impact, has had traditionally an impact, which has helped the right, helped Netanyahu and, and hurt the centre-left. Uh, uh, and we, we have an uptick in terrorism at the moment, and that could, could help Netanyahu as it has in the past. Uh, but there is also a coalition of, of leaders who are determined to uh, prevent him from becoming prime minister again. Uh, including the current Prime Minister, Yair Lapid, and, and three or four other very sophisticated uh, politicians who have uh, managed to prevent him the last time and may still uh, do it again. So we can't count Netanyahu out. Uh, the scenario uh, that was just laid out to you is certainly possible, 
But Benny Gantz has, has history with Netanyahu and a great deal of distrust of Netanyahu's intentions. So that won't be easy to put together. And then, of course, there's a question of the Arabs, what the Arab turnout will be, how many seats they have and who they will go with, um, because that can can really uh, determine the balance uh, between these two blocks. So uh, I've never really accurately predicted uh, an election in the past, but uh, I've never hesitated to go out on a limb. So I'll say that I don't believe that uh, Bibi Netanyahu will be the next prime minister. It's more likely, in my view, to be Yair Lapid. Well, absolutely. That's why we wanted you on the program, because we knew you at least make an effort to give us a, give us an, an answer. Obviously, Israel does have uh, severe security challenges, and one of them is Iran and Iran's uh, purported soon cap capability to have a nuclear weapon. Or, um, where are we on the JCPOA, the, the so-called Iran deal? Uh, there's speculation that the United States may be in a position to renew it relatively shortly. But how does Israel view that, Colonel? Well, the current assessment in Israel is that the U.S. Uh, will eventually overcome the different hurdles with the Iranian government and will eventually sign the agreement. And this actually means that Israel needs to prepare uh, itself militarily. Uh, not that I'm sure that any prime minister in Israel will order a military attack in Iran because that would have a very, very heavy toll. But nevertheless, Israel needs to keep its options open. Uh, and also I can tell you that I do realize that there is a very good dialogue, strategic dialogue, between Israeli officials and American officials. And we know that uh, there are high level uh, Israeli delegations in Washington DC trying to express the Israeli concerns. Uh, and there is a very long list of an Israeli concerns. One of the concerns, for example, is the process of inspection. Let's say the deal is signed tomorrow. And let's say the Israeli intelligence detects some kind of a secret underground nuclear plant, then what would be the most shortest process of inspection in order to prevent that plant from uh, working and uh, uh, moving forward with nuclear capabilities to Iran? The previous JCPOA gave a very, very lengthy uh, process, which uh, from an Iranian perspective was really a present uh, because during such a long time uh, of uh, proposing and inspecting, Iran could hide and, and put tons and tons of concrete on whatever it tried to hide. Another issue is something that was missing in 2015. And obviously, terror groups and terror countries like Iran don't just sit idly by, but invest in weapons. And from time to time, we see exhibitions of drones and different kinds of uh, missiles which are presented on Iranian streets. Um, so here I'm talking about strategic kind of missiles and strategic missiles can carry different kinds of weapons, different kind of explosive to different kinds of ranges. And uh, there should be some sort of uh, understanding of this danger. So this is another chapter in addition to the nuclear capabilities. Uh, and finally, I would say that there is an argument on the issue of Iranian becoming a threshold country. Uh, Israel sees it in one way, the US sees it in a, in a different way. And therefore the direct talks between Israel and the US are very critical. So the Israeli position can be put forward. Having said all of that, Israel does understand that at the end of the day, it will need to protect itself, to defend itself. And that would be the next stage. One of the most positive aspects of President Trump's foreign policy would have been would be the Abraham Accords. And that has created very interesting new alliances. Ambassador, could you talk about that and how that plays into the situation with with Iran? Well, um, the real motivating force behind uh, the countries that uh, uh, sign the Abraham Accords and normalize their relations uh, with Israel. That is the United Arab Emirates uh, and uh, Bahrain in particular, and also Morocco. Uh, the motivating force was a concern about Iran's hegemonic ambitions. 
in the region and the threat they pose directly uh, to these two Gulf countries, Bahrain and, and the UAE. And uh, Israel has a similar concern uh, about the threatening behaviour of Iran in its neighbourhood, on its borders, in Syria, Lebanon and in Gaza. And, and uh, so that common sense of threat uh, provided the motivation for these Arab countries to put aside their long-held refusal to recognise Israel and, and do so. Um, so there's a strategic uh, motivation uh, behind it, uh, but it has uh, had a number of positive effects in terms of the way in which the relationships have been uh, warm, a warm embrace of, of the Israelis, something that the, Israel, the Egyptians and the Jordanians, who had made peace with Israel many years ago and normalized their relations, had kept Israel at arm's length. So there's a different kind of warm peace compared to the cold peace they had. And it's actually had a positive effect on Egypt and Jordan, where they too feel that they have cover and uh, justification and, and a desire not to miss out. Uh, and so they too are warming up their relations with Israel and as a result, moving in to take on more responsibility on the Palestinian issue in Gaza and the West Bank. So the big question, which you haven't asked, but I think is out there, is will this help ultimately in resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? And I believe that we already see the positive uh, benefits of that in terms of the way that Egypt and Jordan, surprisingly, uh, are, are stepping up and working with Israel and the Palestinian Authority. But, but let uh, me interject and ask, won't there have to be a change in the Palestinian leadership? Because right now you have Mah Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, as he is called, and he's in his 80s and seems not to have uh, very much very much leverage. Yes, and the Palestinian Authority is certainly uh, weakening um, and losing control over much of the area uh, of its uh, uh, ambit. Most of the cities of the West Bank are barely under its control now, and that's a, that's a deteriorating situation, which is a big problem. So, yes, I think we're going to need to see a change of leadership on the Palestinian side. What role might the United States play in bringing well, the parties very, together? Yeah, it's very hard for the United States to to engage in in the kind of intervention that would produce a, a new leadership. That's never gone well with the United States in the Middle East, whether it's intervening in Israeli politics or in, in terms of regime change in Iran or Iraq or you name it. So... Uh, there's not a lot that, that we can do about that situation except try to prop up the Palestinian Authority because it has a very important role to play in terms of stabilising the situation between the Israelis and Palestinians and because they are committed to making peace with Israel even though their ability to do so is severely circumscribed. And it's important to point out why. That's because the, the Palestinian polity is split between Palestinian Authority, which controls less and less of the West of the West Bank, and 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 in Gaza, where Hamas is in control, and Hamas is not interested in making peace with Israel, might agree to a kind of long-term ceasefire, but but essentially is committed to Israel's destruction. Excuse me, Ambassador. Just briefly tell our viewers what Hamas is. Is it a counter movement to the Palestinian Authority? Yes, indeed, it is. To, it, it, it's a, a terrorist movement that that uh, has taken over control of, of Gaza, uh, rules in Gaza, uh, but is dedicated to uh, seeking Israel's uh, destruction, its replacement, rather than making peace with it. In contrast to Abu Mazen and the Palestinian Authority, which has recognised Israel and, and committed itself to making peace with Israel. 
Let me ask you this. We have seen over recent days and weeks an uptick in terrorist activity uh, in the West Bank, even in the Jordan Valley, which historically had been relatively calm. There have been some attacks uh, even in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, Colonel, wh why do you think this is happening and what should be Israel's response? So one of the challenges that Israel has is a very big amount of incitement uh, that we see the uh, young Palestinian uh, kids and youth exposed to. We see it on social media. Uh, in addition to this, there is a repetitive narrative about Temple Mount or Haram al-Sharif. And this is a holy mosque, which is located right on top of the Western Wall, which is a Jewish holy place in Jerusalem. Uh, and this uh, narrative, which repeats itself every year and over and over again, uh, especially in Ramadan, but not only during Ramadan times, is that Israel wants to actually seize control and change the conditions of Palestinians and Muslims going to pray on that uh, Temple Mount. And, and that is, of course, not true. Uh, nevertheless, it's sufficient to take out numerous, numerous Palestinians uh, which are identified with Hamas or with very strong anti-Israeli ideology to the streets and try their luck. We have been actually in Israel under a wave of terrorism uh, since March 2nd. And that wave of terrorism still did not cease and did not die. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I agree with the Ambassador Indix uh, statement about the weakness of the Palestinian Authority. And part of that weakness actually translates to the ground. If you take a major Palestinian city, located in the north of the West Bank called Jenin. This is a place where the Palestinian security officials just don't step a foot in. Uh, and therefore, terrorists can, you know, plot and plan and, and, and acquire weapons and, and plan their next terror attack. And we have seen terrorists come from that city and, and perpetrate inside Israel. So I would say this is the combination of reasons for the current terror wave uh, we're at. And also there's no hope, no hope from the local, from the current Palestinian leadership, uh, no, uh, no horizon, no, not anything optimistic in the horizon. Uh, so the combination of all these factors are actually sending uh, uh, Palestinians to the streets to, to terrorize. I want to be sure we touch on Syria a bit more because, Ambassador Indyk, we continue to have a significant number of troops there. What is the role that the U.S. is playing in Syria? Sure, just, just one comment there in terms of the political horizon. It's Israel's responsibility as well to provide a political horizon, not just the Palestinians. And, and Israel has has uh, been unable to do that for a variety of reasons we don't have time to go into, but I think it's, it, it's incumbent on both sides to try to find a way to move forward towards peace and, and not just uh, put all the onus on the weaker party in that regard. As far as Syria, it's a very complicated uh, situation where uh, the uh, Assad regime, backed by Russia and Iran, has managed to survive uh, an internal upheaval and civil war, but doesn't have uh, writ over the whole country. Uh, the Iranians are trying to use Syria to... Uh, First of all, open up a new front with Israel on the Golan Heights, and secondly, uh, to to use it as a, a transit area to get more sophisticated uh, missiles into the hands of Hezbollah in Lebanon, the better to attack or deter Israel. And so uh, there's a war between the wars going on in Syria. Uh, that's what the Israelis call it, where Israel is uh, attacking Iranian positions there trying to get them to stop uh, their efforts to threaten Israel. And Russia basically turns a blind eye to this, even though they control the skies uh, of Syria. The United States is only a, a small player in this game. Uh, it has an interest in, in supporting the Syrian Kurds in the northeast of, of the country. Uh, but essentially, we've kind of delegated uh, the role to Israel and to some extent to Jordan to try to uh, at least uh, prevent 
the chaos of, in Syria from spreading. You know, when we talk about the Middle East, it always seems like it's a bit like the onion. The more we uh, peel, the more we find. I want to thank both of you for being with us. And I hope that we provided all of our viewers um, um, an idea of just what is going to happen and why the elections on November 1st matter uh, to us. And as always, that's our effort here. That's what we want to do, bring different perspectives and talk about things that matter with people who care. Thanks for watching. I'm Jim Falk.